uh, we are now going to talk about paired data. Uh, so, so far the data sets we've come from have come from independent. Uh, so far the data sets we've seen come from independent samples. And they might be measuring the same thing, but they should still be regarded as distinct data points. Uh, paired data is a different case. With paired data, you have two variables that were recorded for one observation. So you have multiple variables, two variables in this case for every single observation, and we're interested in the relationship amongst those variables. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, see how we would possibly plot paired data. The natural plot for paired data is a scatter plot where the for each uh, data so for each observation there's going to be a data point. Uh, it's going to be plotted as a point on a Cartesian plane with one variable being recognized as the X variable and the other as the Y variable. And whatever its uh, values for those variables are corresponds to its location on the plot. So here, for example, is a scatter plot. Let's uh, make let's uh, promote this. This is a scatter plot of uh, we have this fat data set and we have weight modeled by height. And uh, we're just looking at a scatter plot of the data set. Um, here is a subset of the data set where we restrict the height to be at least 60 and the weight to be at least 300. But actually, let's go ahead and look at this earlier plot. When we are looking at um, when we are looking at scatter plots, we are looking for outliers. And there's a couple outliers in this plot, and that would matter a great deal in any sort of uh, analysis involving paired data. So we have an outlier who, someone who has very high weight considering their height, and someone who has uh, a very low height. Uh, this person probably has some sort of dwarfism, if I had to guess, because they're about like this. Is, this must be in inches. So if I had to guess, this person is probably no. This can't be in inches. No, no, inches is fine. Yeah, inches is a, is a reasonable unit. So this person is probably. Like they're 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 probably three feet tall. They're not even three feet, so this person's probably suffering from dwarfism. And um uh you generally shouldn't just throw out outliers. Uh on the other hand, it is probably worthwhile to consider outliers separately from the rest of the sample, especially for those two individuals. One of them is probably morbidly obese, and the other one is probably suffering from dwarfism and probably should be considered separately from the rest of the population. Uh, where in the rest of the population, you're seeing a fairly regular pattern, this cloudy pattern. All right, so when we're working with um, uh, uh, bivariate data sets, uh, we do have some statistics that we can look at to try to quantify the relationship between the variables and the strength of the relationship between the variables. Uh, the most common is the Pearson correlation coefficient. The correlation between two variables is a measure of the strength of their relationship and also the their and also the direction of the of the uh, relationship whether uh, the two variables tend to be both large together or small together or if one tends to be large the other tends to be small something like that so we're not going to talk too much about correlation because I don't consider correlation to be a major focus of this class uh, but we'll talk about it a little bit uh, the sample correlation R represents the correlation between two variables. It is always the case that R is between negative 1 and 1. And if R is 0, there is no linear relationship between the variable. And the linear part really matters. Correlation, or at least this correlation coefficient, matters uh, measures linear relationships. And only linear relationships. It is possible that there are nonlinear relationships among your variables that will be completely undetected by your correlation coefficient. Because it only cares about linear relationships. So... <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so uh, be aware of that this in here would be a linear relationship because you could imagine there there would be a line, a straight line that could go through this data and at some level understand it to some to some quality. Uh, whereas uh, a quadratic relationship would be something that correlation would not be very well suited to uh, quantify, or at least not before a transformation. Uh, if the magnitude of the correlation is 1, there is a perfect linear relationship between the variables. That means that if you were to plot those variables, they would fall exactly on the line. 
um, there would be like this right here it does not fall exactly on a line because there's some wavering around whatever that line would be. Whereas if there's a perfect linear relationship, it would fall precisely on the line if it were one. And if it's close to one, then it's going to be close to a perfect line. And if it's far from one, then it's probably going to be quite distant from a perfect line, like, for example, this data set here. Um, so this, <coughs> so that's basically talking. So the magnitude of the correlation coefficient quantifies the strength of the relationship in a sense of, like, can one variable almost perfectly predict the other one if you know it? Um, the sign of the correlation coefficient also matters. If a correlation coefficient is positive, then that means that as one ver that if one variable is larger than the, than average, the other variable will also be larger than average, uh, re with respect to its own average in a sense. Uh, whereas if we have a negative relation or a negative correlation coefficient or an R less than zero then if one variable is above its average, then the other one tends to be below its average. So that's what positive and negative uh, means. So uh, no real world data set that you haven't engineered has a correlation that's perfectly zero, one, or negative one. Well, okay, that's actually not quite true. I could imagine real world data sets having correlations of one or negative one. And that is if one of the variables in the data set is effectively a linear transformation of the other one. So for example, uh, let's say that everybody, let, let, let's say there was a flat tax regime or uh, like there's no radiation in taxes. Everybody's going to pay 20% of their income in taxes. Everybody pays the exact same amount or set exact same proportion of their income in taxes. I think also sales tax might be an example of this. So you might look at maybe um, how much someone spent in the state and on like groceries and the amount of sales tax they paid. Um, that should be a that or very well could be a perfectly linear relationship. There could be some uh, uh, there could be something in the tax code that causes it to not quite be the case, like. Maybe there's a different food tax as opposed to a regular sales tax or something like that. But generally, um, how? But generally, it should be like you know, your the amount that you actually paid in taxes is going to be perfectly predicted by um, how how much you spend at the store. In which case, a so a, a correlation of one uh, or negative one is possible. And what that would signify is that effectively one variable has all the information about the other one. So really, you're measuring one variable rather than two. Uh, so, <coughs> yeah, that's how you would understand, at least how I would understand, a perfect linear relationship. But that said, it is still, I would almost call it a modeling error if that actually, actually happened. So, generally, uh, um, correlations are not going to be zero or one. So, all right, then what does it mean to be a um, weak or strong correlation? Um, we are not going to say precisely that there is or is not. We're, we're going to say that there is, um, there's some gradations and you might, um, like, I feel like my students, I, I tell them these rules and they want to take them very seriously. Um, and I kind of feel like that's not, a good idea these are more rules of thumb so for example if r is between 0 and 0.3 we'd probably say there isn't a correlation uh if if r is between 0.3 and 0.7 it's probably a weak correlation and if r is greater than or equal to 0.7 then you have a strong correlation and i feel like students want to take these uh these uh rules of thumb very seriously as almost as if they're the the word of god or something when they really are just rules of thumb, and like we would say, if we did if we did a statistical test and conclude that the correlation was not zero, um, then they're then the two variables are correlated, weak, strong, whatever. It doesn't matter. Well, it it, it kind of does, but yeah, there's 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 actually a lot of gray area in statistics, and that's something that I hope that students could start to appreciate, but. Um, like if, if your correlation's not zero, then they're, and you can say that with some degree of certainty, then the variables are correlated, um, whether it's 0.1 or point 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 nine nine. 
So these are more just rules of thumb. It's a way for you to possibly think about correlation, reason about correlation. On the other hand, it's probably just better to be thinking about the context in which you're working. Um, you know, have like context dependent um, interpretations of what is actually a, a strong correlation, what is a weak one. So, yeah, there there's some ways to think about correlations, but don't read too much into them. Um, don't yeah, don't don't take them too seriously. These are rules of thumb. Okay, so uh, so here's some illustrations of potential correlations. Um, I create some simulated data sets. There are a hundred data points in these data sets. The mean is always going to be uh, zero zero. So the x mean is zero and the y mean is zero. And uh, this right here is just describing how the two variables vary. They're both going to have the same variance, but possibly different correlations. Uh, this is simulating from a multivariate normal distribution, so we're not... And I'm not going to talk about that all that much. Well, actually, no, I do talk about the multivariate normal in the lecture. So maybe revisit what I've got here after seeing that. Anyway... I created a data set. This is a data set where the correlation is zero, and I know for a fact that the two variables are uncorrelated. Here's another one where uh, the correlation is on the is at the point three one, so it's like on the barrier between uh, weak and strong. Here's one where the correlation is point seven, and you can pretty well see that there is a a relationship between these two variables. And uh, we would probably say that in the point three case, let's create another. Let's let's see that plot again. Like there might be some correlation between them, but it is pretty weak. Uh, whereas here, they're definitely correlated. And uh, for the next one, they're perfectly correlated. So this is a correlation of one. So, all right. Um, maybe better would be something where we, let's go back to say uh, this data set, maybe picking something in the, at, at like the midpoint would be better. So changing this to 0.5. So, and then if we were to do the same thing for DAT3, changing this to 0.8. Okay, so then if we were to plot uh, DAT2, like this is probably a better visual representation of weak correlation. The, the, the R value is not 0.3, by the way. Uh, I just didn't change the label. Oh, wait. Uh, I want to see this one. Oh, no, no, no. I just... Uh, uh, okay, so I want to see the plot. Okay, there we go. Um, and this one has a correlation of 0.8, which, again, would probably be read as strong correlation between the two. Um, all right, so... Um, and again, these are totally rules of thumb. Like, for example, I work in time series, and if the autocorrelation, which is a very similar concept, is uh, 0.5, we would consider that autocorrelation actually fairly strong. Um, so it's largely a matter of opinion. Anyway, uh, so if we're computing correlations, the function that we could use is core. And we just can feed it something like core x, y, where x is a variable and y is a variable, they need to be vectors, if you're going to use it this way. They need to be vectors, they need to be of equal length, and the first observation of x needs to correspond with the first observation of y, the second observation of x needs to correspond with the second observation with y, and vice versa, and, and so on. Uh, so basically, these need to contain paired observations in order for your correlation to be of any, of any meaning. Um, Alright, so here's a correlation between the height and the weight variables in that fat data set although uh maybe be a little wary of this number because as we saw they there are outliers in that data set and actually correlation does care about outliers uh correlation is sensitive to outliers and if there are outliers in your data set um it will react to them how exactly it reacts to them actually depends greatly on the outliers like you could have certain outliers that the correlation doesn't seem that doesn't actually affect the correlation coefficient at all, and you can have other outliers that uh, affect it greatly because in one case the outliers are 
trend confirming. In the other case, the outliers are uh, trend defying. Uh, so, yeah, how exactly a uh, correlation responds to outliers is very case dependent. Anyway, uh, again, correlation is very much linear correlation. So here are two variables, X and Y, uh, that clearly have a relationship. It's a quadratic relationship. There's a quadratic relationship between these two variables. So you would conclude that there's a relationship, but the correlation is perfectly zero. So, yeah, you should um, understand that correlations talk about linear relationships only. Now, what we could do possibly for this data set is say, all right, let's take, um, we'll say, let's compute the correlation between X and the square root of Y. Uh, huh. Let's see. Uh, plot X square root of Y. Oh, that's... Uh, that's the absolute value function. Okay. Um, <coughs> well, you could possibly apply basically some uh, transformation to this data set uh, along the lines of square root. Maybe what, what you probably need to do is multiply by the sign of the, of the observations and you get a correlation of one. And uh, so what you could do to get around the uh, linear requirement is basically look at a transformed version of your variables and then you might detect a relationship. Now, of course, like I need to say this right now because I just talked about correlation, so I must say this because it's my I'm a statistician and it's my job, and I'm going to say that correlation is not causation. Uh, so there's causal relationships and there's correlation. A causal relationship is when you say one variable causes another. In other words, if you have the power to change the first variable, then the other variable will respond to the change that you just inflicted. Um, so, because in so, at some degree, uh, there, there's a sense in which the second variable depends on the first variable in a very strong sense in that while the first variable may not particularly care about what the second one is, the second one cares a great deal about what the first one is, so you might call that causal. Um, so, actually, when you really... I've heard that the notion of causality is actually very tricky. Um that it's really hard to even come up with a language about causality because you start to try to define causality and it seems like the the uh, definitions start to elude. Well, they, 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 it's, it's actually really hard to define causality in a very proper way. Uh, um, so there's some... Like philosophical debate about what causality is and what it means and so on. And even whether we even care about it. But there is probably some notion of cause, right? Of something happening before another and the other thing reacting to the first thing that happened in the sequence. And correlation is not does not imply that there is a causal relationship. If there is a causal relationship, you probably you hopefully would have a positive correlation. Uh, but it is, in fact, also possible for two variables to be positively correlated, even though the, you would not say that there's any sort of um, deeper relationship between the two of them. Um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, for example, there is a website called... Uh, well, there's a website that contains spurious cor correlations. Let's uh, maybe open up a window with that website, just so you can get a sense of what uh, what's in it. So, tylervision.com. Okay, so he wrote this, uh, or came up with this little uh, desk, uh, uh, coffee table book. And it just contains ridiculous correlations. Like, for example, spending on science based on technology and suicides by hanging stra strangulation suffocation. Uh, correlation of 0.99. Uh, oh, that's another thing I've forgotten to mention. Correlation doesn't have units. Uh, it has zero units. So uh, whatever your correlation number is, it just is what it is. You don't have, like, there. it doesn't have any notion of units. Um, uh, number of people who drowned by falling in a pool and films Nicolas Cage appeared in. Uh, per capita cheese consumption and number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Correlation of 0 0.94. Uh, the 94.71% thing actually is not. I, I disagree with this. Right, I would I would look only at this number. <coughs> uh, divorce rate in Maine and per capita consumption of margarine. 
Okay. Correlation of 0.99. Age of Miss America and murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. 0.87. I think you get the point. There's a lot of these. I'm only through 42% of the page. Uh, worldwide non-commercial space launches and sociology doctorates awarded. Um, uh, per capita con consumption of mozzarella cheese and civil engineer doctorates awarded. Yeah. All right. So, uh, first off, one way that correlations can happen is your data sets are just small. Like, if you look at these data sets, they are not large. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so there's ten observations here. And if you have... that, That is not a lot, by the way. Ten observations is not a lot of observations. If you've got ten observations and you've got... Um, a data set consisting of 50 variables, there's a good chance that you're going to find a correlation. Somewhere. Anywhere. Any correlation at all. So, you decide, I want to write a paper. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to take a paper, I'm going to take this giant data set with 5,000 variables and see what the strongest relationships were in the last 10 years. You will find something. Guaranteed. So, one way spurious correlations like that can emerge is just sample size problems. It could emerge because two variables are trending together. Like another, um, let's see, I would say, oh, I, th I can't remember what it was. I remember there was something where you were correlating like a total, uh, like a margarine consumption and number of pirates in the Caribbean or something like that. And just... Like, margin consumption is increasing over time, and number of pirates in the Caribbean is decreasing over time. Something like that, where basically you just have two variables that are trending, and due to the fact that they trend over time, they become correlated. So time series can start exhibiting these spurious correlations, if you're not accounting for just trend effects particularly well. Um, it could also be due to... A more complicated causal relationship, for example, latent variables. So you can have um, a variable. You can have, for example, you th you think that so you you observe a correlation between x and y, and you say, okay, x causes y. It could be because x causes y. It could be because y causes x, or it could be because both variables are caused by z, and you didn't and you never saw z, and you might call z a latent variable. So an example of a latent variable that I like to bring up is uh, damage caused by fires and the number of firefighters that showed up to the fire. Chances are there's a positive correlation ship. A correlation ship. Very good. There's a, there's a positive correlation between number of firefighters at the scene and the damage caused by the fire. And it's not because firefighters cause fires. This is not Fahrenheit 4... Uh, is it Fahrenheit 451? Is that what the book's called? Uh, all right, now I need to look at Fahrenheit 451. Is that, that what it's called? Yeah, that's what it's called. All right, so this is not Fahrenheit 451 where firefighters cause fires. Uh, this, is, this is just because when you have a more intense fire, it's going to both cause more damage and attract more firefighters. So there's a latent variable, the intensity of the fire that was never being accounted for in like this this uh so uh, sort of study. So yeah, there's a lot of reasons why you might see a correlation amongst your variables that has nothing to do with any sort of causal relationship, and that's something that you would have to consider. It is possible to try to infer causal relationships. We do it all the time in statistics and science and so on. Like uh things you can do are do actual controlled experiments where you effectively remove all possibility or ideally remove all possibility of having a latent variable that could be contaminating any sort of correlational interpretations. That's one thing that you could possibly do. Or you could... Um, uh, there's also these econometric techniques that could potentially be used. Econometrics cares a great deal about uh, causation and being able to identify causation because you're often unable to perform scientific studies on economic series or economic data sets for uh, practical and uh, ethical reasons. 
So uh, you might have to do something to uh, you might have to use some special techniques in order to be able to possibly infer uh, what causality is. So that's uh, another thing that could uh, be done. So just use more advanced statistical techniques. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. So correlation doesn't mean causation, but that at the same time, though, there comes a time where cor- where you do enough studies and like maybe you can't actually study what you really want to study. Like, for example, if you're interested in whether cigarettes cause cancer, like the scientific consensus on this is that cigarettes cause cancer. But you cannot conduct a study where you tell some people to smoke cigarettes and other people not and then see who gets cancer. That's unethical. We do not do that in the United States. So um, so there may be an ethics reason why you cannot do a scientific study that would in fact have some causality component um, or, or some causal interpretation. So what are you going to do? Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that you just give up. It doesn't mean that you just say, well, we can't do the experiment, so we're going to quit. No, it doesn't mean that. You might look at those correlations because even though you cannot immediately conclude that there is a causal relationship, it does kind of suggest that something's going on. And if the scientific literature is thorough enough in its investigation of the issue, even though a perfect study was never done you might still be able to conclude that there is some causal relationship because at some point it's the only explanation left that makes any sense so you've eliminated all the bad explanations because you kept checking them and they just kept not working out um and eventually you're just left with the one uh interpretation that was causal even though you that that is a causal relationship even though you uh uh, never conducted a study. So this is kind of getting into how you do science. And uh, I, I probably should just leave it there. I'm just, I just need to have that spiel. Because we talked about correlation. And once you talk about correlation, you need to talk about what it means. All right. It just is talking about a pure relationship between variables. Right. It says the, the variables are related somehow. And it doesn't say why. Okay. Um, I also have an example to kind of show this point where if you don't um, like if you have small data sets, then there's a very good chance that you could discover correlations just cause. So what I did here was I uh, constructed 10 data sets and I know that the observations in all of these data sets are independent of each other. There is no relationship amongst any of these uh, variables. So, and I've only got five observations. So I've got 10 variables and I think, uh, uh, how many observations? Uh, five. Five observations, 10 variables. And this is a pairs plot, but it's a version of the pairs plot where the plots are on, the, the scatter plots are above the diagonal, but below the diagonal are correlation coefficients. And like very, the, the fourth and the 10th variables have a 0.93 correlation. This is what their line looks like. Okay, it's the absolute value of, this is a negative, or maybe it is. I don't know. Th- there. Okay, it clearly is. Um, so there's a negative relationship, but I only care about the magnitude. And the magnitude is a 0.93. So it's like, oh, these two things are perfectly correlated. The one thing causes the other. It's like, no, no, they are actually independent. When I generated this data set, they were independent variables. There's no relationship between them. Um, the only reason why this 0.93 shows up is because we simulated enough variables that it was going to happen. Like, it actually happens in a number of places. We get a correlation of 0.83, right? A fairly high correlation between two variables that have nothing to do with each other. Uh, Another uh, correlation of 0.87. These variables have nothing to do with each other. So if you start looking for correlations, you will find them if your sample size is small and um, and your dimension, the number of variables you're looking at, is large. Okay. All right. I've said enough. Um... Let's uh, move on to trend lines. So a trend line is a best fitting line that passes through data in a data set. And it shows what linear relationships between the data tend to prevail. Uh, We have the line itself that represents predicted values of, uh, well, of one variable if you know the other one. 
And the distance between the, we have a dependent variable and an independent variable in a sense. I actually don't like that terminology in statistics because independent has a different meaning in probability. So probably shouldn't use that word around here. Uh, there, I, I think a better word is um, a response variable and an explanatory variable where the explanatory corresponds with X and the response corresponds with Y. And the explanatory variable is seen to be as is is often seen as something that you get to see, or something that you think is causing the other variable. Uh, that's kind of what you would think of as an explanatory variable. Um, but anyway, <coughs> um, you uh, um, so when uh, when you can when you compute a best fit line, you view the line itself as being the prediction if you knew what the explanatory was for the uh, response variable. So you have this prediction and the distance between the line, which represents your predicted value, and the actual observation is known as the residual. And best fitting lines are best in the sense that they, that they minimize the squared, su uh, the squared sum of residuals. So <coughs> this is actually a situation where uh, we probably should um, be looking at the rendered math. So let's go to the course page. Uh, so math 370, summer lecture notes. Because looking at the LaTeX is probably going to miss something. So let's uh, scroll down. Okay. So, all right. So we have a line of this form where we say y hat i is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 xi. y hat i is the value of y uh, that's predicted by the trend line for the, ver for the value xi. So beta naught is the y-intercept of the line and beta 1 is the slope of the line. And what you end up with is the best fitting line. This function right here, lm y tilde x data equals d, where y is your, is your response variable and x is your predicting variable, or y is your uh, predicted variable, x is your predicting, y is your response, x is your explanatory. There's a whole bunch of different vocabulary you could use to describe these two things. And d is your data set that contains both x and y. Um, LM will compute this line, this best fitting line. So um, we can save that fit in uh, into an object. Uh, we could see what the coefficients of the line are using the coefficients function or by using the dollar sign notation. Okay, so um, here, for example, is the... Here I estimate the coefficients for the best fitting line for the uh, fat data set where I'm modeling weight by height. And uh, we do... So uh, let's have a look at the data set itself. And then let's plot this best fitting line. And the way we can do that, pass the result of this call, uh, which estimated a best fitting line, uh, pass that result to a function called AB line. And it will draw the line that supposedly best fits the data. Now what we see is that it's, it's fit is weird. And actually if we were to zoom in on this region, this region right here, the fit wouldn't actually look all that great. We wouldn't say it's the best fitting line. And the reason why this line isn't exactly all that great is because we have an outlier here, which I, I'm not really sure how much effect this outlier has, but this one over here, uh, this person who's probably suffering from, or not suffering, but this person who probably has dwarf, dwarfism, um, this person's probably, since they're probably strongly affecting this trend line because the trend line is going to try to uh, make that distance as small as possible. But the thing though is that distance is quite large, especially if it were to try to fit this region well, then the distance here would be quite large. And the line is the, like this, this function that we're trying to minimize doesn't like that. So what we should probably do honestly is remove those outliers from the data set. If we want a good, uh, a trend line. So this is a much better trend line. If we restrict our data set to the non outliers, we end up with a much better looking trend line. Uh, so the thing, all right, so that's all I want to say about that because 
this is a this is linear regression. We're seeing a little bit of linear regression, and that is a Math 3080 topic at the University of Utah. We don't really talk about linear regression in Math 3070. So we're kind of drifting out from where this course is supposed to be. So if you're more interested in this, you should be taking Math 3080 or possibly your other class at the University of Utah, like an econometrics class or something. So, um, so yeah, we're just going to leave it there. But this is one of the things that, honestly, it's a pretty interesting part of statistics, so I would hope that you'd be interested in learning more about this. Um, once you start talking about regression models, and that's that's when you get opened up to modeling, and modeling has a lot of power in it. It's also very easily abused, so uh, there's a lot... Of, like, this is a whole topic in and of itself. This is a whole class all by itself. I hope that you are curious about it and would want to learn more about it. All right. Uh, we're going to end the class uh, or end this video here. Uh, I'm next going to talk about uh, categorical bivariate data and how we could possibly understand relationships amongst categorical variables. Because everything we've, working, we've been working with so far, you'd probably understand as quantitative. And it would be nice to be able to talk about categorical, too. All right, so that's it, and uh, I hope you have a good day.